Thanks for joining us for this week's Summer Shorts. Today we're going to dig deep into history. We'll start by learning about fossils, and then we'll learn about ancient writing systems. We'll learn to build our own obelisk, like one you would see in the ancient city of Aksum. We'll also learn a little bit about the Underground Railroad. Before we get started, I want to remind you about all the fun programs that you can watch or participate on in from home. You can um, join us every Thursday for Reading with Rover. That's at 4 o'clock on Thursdays. And every Friday we have family trivia also at 4 o'clock. So remember, family's at 4. You can learn about all the other programs that we're offering from our website at snowisle.org slash summer dash reading. So let's go ahead and get started. Today I've invited a couple family members to join me. This is my great, great, great grandfather and his wife, my great, great, great grandmother. I wonder what life was like when they were alive. Judging by the looks on their faces, I think life might have been kind of hard. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's dig into history. Hi, my name is Rihanna and I work at the Oak Harbor Library. Today, I get to tell you about fossils. Now, if you're anything like me, you think dinosaurs are awesome. Now, we don't have a whole lot of them walking around today, but that doesn't mean that we can't still learn a whole lot from them. Now, the term fossil refers to any trace of a past life form. There's two that I'm gonna talk about today, body fossils and trace fossils. Body fossils will show the physical remains of what that organism looked like. Trace fossils give us a little bit more context as to how that organism lived. Think of it this way. If body fossils give us the what, trace fossils can give us the how. So let's look at body fossils. If an animal dies in a muddy environment, most of the body will break down, leaving behind bones and shells. When layers of dirt and sediment will build up over time, that material will harden into rock as the bones disintegrate. What it leaves behind is an imprint, which gives us a rough idea of what that animal looked like. Now, it won't give us things like the colors or certain details, but it's a pretty accurate representation that this was once this. We can find teeth and shells as well, which give us lots more detail, and you can even find entire creatures such as trilobites, which lived 250 million years ago. Now for trace fossils. Have you ever walked on wet sand at the beach and seen that as you're walking, you've left footprints behind you? That's just how trace fossils are made. Let's say a large dinosaur left behind footprints where it walked. Then a large volcano erupted, shooting ash and sediment into the air. All of those things will fill that footprint, and as the material around it hardens into rock and eventually the sediments will deteriorate, what we're left with is a perfect footprint. Trace fossils can also be things like nests and burrows, but they can also be something called coprolite, and that is dinosaur poop. And we can actually learn a whole lot from coprolite. We can learn what the animal ate and how it digested its food. Now I'm going to show you how you can make your very own fossils. The best thing about this recipe is that it only takes three ingredients. That is water, salt, and flour. Now you can use all-purpose flour, but you can also use coconut flour or almond flour. It just makes the texture a little bit rougher, but still gives you great results. So first, we are going to add two cups of all-purpose flour. And one cup of just plain table salt. And finally, we're going to add our warm water. And then since it is warm water, I'm going to use a little spatula here. And when you stir it up, it kind of just looks like regular baking dough, like if you were making biscuits or anything like that. But you'll see it gets very, very dense very quickly, and that is what we want. So we have our initial stir there, and you can kind of see those bumps and stuff that are forming, and that is how we're going to make our dough. 
So what I'm gonna do is just start mixing it with my hands because that is the most fun part of this whole thing. And what's really great is that if it starts feeling really sticky, you can just add a little bit more flour. Or if it starts feeling a little bit too crumbly, you can add a little bit more water. So it's not an exact science, not quite as difficult as making real fossils, and definitely not quite as long, which if you're impatient like me, that is awesome. So let's see here. It's starting to get really nice form dough. You want it to where when you pick it up, you can kind of ball it together. Almost like the consistency of Play-Doh when you first take it out of the tub. So this is looking pretty good and it makes a huge batch. So we're only going to use a little bit of it so I can show you what this looks like. So you want to flatten it out as much as you can. And the thinner it is, the less it will take to completely dry. So I'm going to borrow this guy here, borrow his foot to be precise. And what we're gonna do is just smush that foot right on top of our dough. See if we can get a really great footprint. There we go, look at that. And what's really awesome about this is that if you have very patient pets, you can use this with dog prints or cat prints, which are a little bit more difficult. Or you can also make ornaments or if you want to paint them, I recommend waiting about a day before putting them in the oven, have that full 24 hours, and then you want to bake them at 120 degrees in the oven for roughly three hours. And then you want to dry it again overnight before painting it, just to make sure it's totally dry, you won't get those cracks and everything in there that you don't want, but the result is totally worth it. Thanks for joining me. Be sure to visit snow-isle.org slash summer-reading for more online and printable resources. Hi, I'm Miss Kim and I work at the Edmonds Library. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what life was, life was like before books like these had ever been invented. For thousands of years, people have had the same thoughts and records and ideas that they've needed to permanently record that we do. They used throughout all that time before these sorts of books were invented lots of different writing systems and different materials to record all of that information. So today we're going to explore a few civilizations and the different writing systems and materials that they used. For more details on the projects that we're going to do, go to snowisle.org backslash summer reading. You'll find all the details for the projects as, and along with some more information so you can dig deeper into these different cultures. So are you ready? Let's get started. We're going to start with the ancient Mayan civilization. The ancient Mayans lived about 3,000 to about 300 years ago. They built great big cities in this part of the world in what is now Mexico and Central America. And there's still Mayans that live there, but they don't use the pictoglyph system of writing that was invented during the time of the ancient Mayans. Back then they had these glyphs, pictoglyphs, that represented sounds, ideas, and objects, and they would carve them into their buildings. And they would also draw them onto fig bark books called codices. One by itself is called a codex. And so you can go to the website and find these panels there. And if you have some fig bark, you can make a fig bark one. But I used a shopping bag. And there's a picture there that shows an actual page of a codex. So you can color in these panels and model what you color based on what the ancient Mayan actually did in their codices or in one of their codex books. All right, so now we're going to go even farther back into time to the ancient Sumerians. They lived about between 4,000 years ago to 7,000 years ago, long time ago. And they were found in the, what is called the Fertile Crescent. It's where civilizations first began to sprout up 
and it's now modern day Iraq. It's hard to see, I know, but it's fun to play with a globe when you're talking about history. It's right there in Iraq, and they developed a writing system called cuneiform, where they would take a stylus, which is a sharp stick, and imprint their cuneiform letters into blocks of clay, usually bigger sheets. This is just a little sample. I chose the letter K, which looks a little like an F. I used a fork to imprint it into the clay. There's a recipe for the clay on the, on the website, but any clay will do. And then they would take their tablets and lay them out in the sun and they would dry and harden and they would have a permanent record then. So it's kind of fun to think about maybe doing your homework on clay tablets like this. Um, I actually used some um, oil pastels to make color contrast so you could see it on the screen. But you don't have to do that. You can just feel the imprint like an ancient Sumerian would have. All right, next stop is ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, which this, at, Egypt is in the northern part of this giant continent called Africa where you see all these different countries. Egypt is one of them. Modern day Egypt, you can go and visit there, but they don't use the hieroglyphic system anymore. Ancient Egypt was from about, let's see, 5,000 to 2,000 years ago. And they used a system called hieroglyphics a little bit like the Mayans did. It's, it's pictures used to represent sounds, ideas, and objects. And this is the project related to this. They would use their hieroglyphs on any flat surfaces. You'd see them painted on walls. This is something called a, a cartouche. This project is modeling after a tile called a cartouche and it would have a name written in the middle of it because Egyptians, ancient Egyptians believed that if your name was remembered, you would live forever in the afterlife. So I wrote my name in hieroglyphics there. Go to the website and you can learn how to do it too. But don't put the clay away yet because our third project is also having to do with clay. We're going to be looking at the Vikings and the rune system. They lived in uh, Northern Europe. They were actually credited with um, being one of the first Europeans to go across the Atlantic to the North American continent. They went down into Russia and they developed a system called runes that about 1300 to about 900 years ago that they thought was magic. They would do things with their letters to bring good luck into their lives. In fact, if you were to go and look at Thor's hammer in the Marvel comics, there should be rune letters there because the Viking warriors would do that with their weapons so that they would be extra powerful in battle. So you can make this, this pendant. It's just a little square of clay. Don't forget to put the hole in it um, before it dries. And then you can just write your name in the rune letters they're all available on the website. I wonder if when you wear it, you'll feel more powerful. Could be. All right. Our last stop, our last historical stop is with the ancient Chinese. Um, they developed, well, let's look at first where they were. This is modern day China right here, this big blue. And they were on this, the ancient borders were more, whoops, more on this side. It's hard to see there. Um, but there's a picture of a map of the ancient borders on the website too, so check that out. And you can of course go to modern day China, but and, and they actually use the same, the system of writing that was developed in ancient times. They would do slat books, something called slat books, where they would take strips of bamboo like this, this is, these are craft stick, sticks, but they would have strips of bamboo, they would tie them together, and they would write down the strips, and actually they would start on this side, down the strips, and read this way. And when they invented paper, they invented a lot of things, but when they invented paper, they kept the same system of starting on this side and going down the page like this for their writing and their reading. And the character system has a character for every single word in the language. So modern Chinese has 50,000 characters that you could learn 
That's a lot to learn. So try it out. Play around with that. All right. So that does it for me. We, we want you to visit that website for more additional online and printable resources. And then don't stop there. Dig even deeper in looking into the ancient Mayan, Sumerian, Egyptian, Viking, and Chinese cultures. There's so much to explore. Bye. Hi, my name is Kat and I work at the Edmonds Library. Today we're going to talk about freedom quilts. Behind me you can see a quilt that was hand sewn by a relative in my family many, many years ago. Um, quilts are usually hand sewn bed covers. They often have a repeating pattern in them. We're going to talk about freedom quilts. This is not a freedom quilt, but in order to understand what freedom quilts were about, we need to talk a little bit about slavery. Slavery is a sad part of human history that has existed since the early history of humankind. In ancient Rome, for instance, enslaved people were foreigners captured in war who were forced to build homes and buildings and roads and to work in mines. It doesn't make any sense to own another person, but that did happen. The history books tell us that in 1619, the first slave ships arrived from Africa, bringing human beings as slaves to work the land that the Europeans colonized. Today, that land is what we call the South. The enslaved people were treated as property. They were not allowed to go to school, to buy land, or to vote. They were treated very badly, and often they tried to escape but sometimes they were treated even worse once they escaped and were captured and brought back to the plantation. Sometimes members of their family were mistreated as well. But the enslaved people just wanted to be free. It's natural to want to escape. For about 70 years, from about 1790 to about 1860, the Underground Railroad was set up to help enslaved people escaped to the north where they could hope to live in freedom. The Underground Railroad was not an actual railroad with real trains, but rather a series of safe houses along a route that took people from the south to the northern free states. Here's a rough map that shows you in the light gray you'll see the southern slave states and the dark gray are the northern free states at that time in history. Over here, these are not even states yet. And the lines show you the direction that the enslaved people would move towards the north to get to freedom. And these are what we know as the Underground Railroad. Here's a picture of Harriet Tubman. She's probably one of the most famous conductors on the Underground Railroad that you'll ever hear about. We don't have many good photographs of Harriet Tubman because she lived such a long time ago. Photography was not common at all. You can learn more about Harriet Tubman by reading books from the library. This is one I read recently. It's called Chasing Freedom. It's written by Nikki Grimes and it's a fictionalized account of Harriet Tubman having a conversation with Susan B. Anthony. One thing I like about this book is the background for the pictures where the women are the main um, focus of the picture. You can see in the background, those are quilts. And you can see some of the patterns that we're gonna talk about in just a minute here in those quilts. So some historians believe that women, enslaved women, would create these quilts with patterns in them that conveyed a message. Sometimes they were stitched, um, like I said, secretly so that nobody else would understand what the symbol meant other than other enslaved people. They didn't want to use words to communicate because they wanted it to be a secret. And besides, most enslaved people at that time were not allowed to read, so it wouldn't make sense to use words anyway. 
So some people believe that these quilts were hung outside of safe houses. Uh, they might have been hung outside of log cabins within the plantation as a signal for what was about to come. For instance, this one is known as the wagon wheel, and it's believed to communicate the message that an escape is imminent, so it's time to start packing everything you need to take with you on your journey. You could only take as much as you could carry, so it was very important to be selective about what you take with you. The monkey wrench was a reminder to bring some tools. For instance, you might need a compass or even weapons and some tools to help build shelter along the route. This is called the log cabin. It's just a series of concentric rectangles and a square in the middle. But if you saw this symbol outside a house, it was intended to mean that it was a safe house. The people inside would probably take you in, let you stay for the night, and even offer you food in some cases. The crossroads indicated that you were getting close to crossing from the south to the north to where it's free. And this one is called the drunkard's path. It was a reminder to the escapees to follow zigzag patterns as they're running away and running towards freedom. A zigzag would make it harder to be captured by slave catchers. If slave catchers caught escapees, they were often severely punished. And the flying geese was a reminder to follow the path of geese who are migrating from the south to the north. Geese know how to find their way north. They also know where to find fresh water. So you'll have a chance to download those images from our resource packet on our website at snowwild.org slash summer dash reading. And I wonder about today, if you are going to put a symbol outside of your home, what would it say? Would it be one of those pictures that um, give a message to somebody else? Or would you choose to put a sign up like this one? This says, hate has no home here. You might see that outside some people's houses. It is also written in other languages and it lets people know that the people who live inside this house are what we call allies. They want to support people um, of all ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, so that they know that they are safe in that community or in that home. You might see this sign in some people's windows, Black Lives Matter. I have a neighbor with a big peace sign in her front window. And I've seen people with heart signs in their window or outside their home. I wonder what sign you would put in front of your home or maybe outside your room. So here are the quilt squares that I colored. And I wonder if you can remember, we talked about two of these, we didn't talk about all three, but do you remember this one? That's the log cabin, right? The concentric rectangles with the square in the middle. And that indicates a safe house. And this one, zigzag, right? The drunkard's path. Remember to zigzag to escape being caught. This one's called the bear's paw. We didn't talk about it, but it was uh, intended to remind um, escapees where the edge of the plantation's property was. So once you pass that spot, you're likely to be chased and you don't want to go too far unless you're prepared to do so. So I would love for you to take a picture of whatever coloring you do or if you come up with some symbols, some pictures to share. Um, you can email those to summershorts at snowisle.org and maybe we'll put them on our website. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye. Hello, everybody. My name is Kimberly. I work at the Snohomish Library, and I'm going to talk to you today about the Kingdom of Aksum. The Kingdom of Aksum originated around 400 BC, and it lasted up until 940 AD. It reached its peak 
from the first century AD to the seventh century AD. Where was it located? I'm so glad you asked. Aksum was located in modern day Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Southern Arabia, particularly in Yemen. The Aksumite people were seafarers. They sailed up and down the Red Sea and traded with other big name countries of their day, such as Egypt, Rome, Persia, and India. What were some of the things they traded? My friend, let me tell you. They exported frankincense. What is frankincense? It is a resin that is collected from trees. So what they would do is they would cut open a tree, collect its sap, and then they would let that dry and that would become resin. Depending on what tree they cut is what kind of resin that they had. The most popular ones were frankincense and also, I'm getting it, hold on. <gasps> Myrrh, yes. Myrrh is also a resin that was collected from trees in Africa. And it was used just like frankincense for religious ceremonies, for healing, and fascinating. All right, so those weren't the only things they exported and they traded. They also mined salt and, can you guess, gold? Yes. There were several gold mines and they would mine those or they would get it from civilizations in the interior of Africa and then they would export it to buyers across the world. Last but not least, they exported ivory. Ivory is collected from the tusks of elephants. So, you had these people who were trading all across the world and had people from all across the world come and live in their capital city of Aksum. What language do you think they spoke? The language they spoke was called Giez, and this is what it looks like. Unfortunately, it isn't spoken in modern day Ethiopia today, but it's still used in religious ceremonies or for religious contexts. One of the things that makes the ancient kingdom of Aksum interesting and stands out from some of its other ancient African civilizations is that they made coins. If you could mint your own coins in the ancient world, you knew you'd made it. So they made their coins out of gold and silver. And often what they would do is they would have their king on one side of the coin, and on the other half of the coin, they would have symbologies. When the kingdom of Aksum converted to Christianity under the reign of King Azana, then King Azana had um, crosses on the back of the coins in addition to his face, so that other people could know that the kingdom of Aksum was now a Christian kingdom. One of the things that the Aksumite people built were called stele. What are stele? I'm glad you asked. Stele are stone monuments. They're usually very huge. Um, they are also sometimes called obelisks. The main difference between stele and obelisks are that obelisks are um, specialized, whereas stele are the more common ones. So one of the ones that still exists to this day, if you go to Ethiopia, you can see this. It is called the Obelisk of Aksum, or King Azana's stele.
It's used to mark underground burial chambers. And like I said, it still stands today in Stele Park with other Stele that mark different areas and important burial chambers. So why do I mention all this about Stele? Fascinating that you should wonder. You're going to make your own paper obelisk. This is very easy to make. I decorated mine with some symbols. You can decorate yours in any way possible. What you'll need is super simple. First, you'll need the template that you can get from the links that I will provide. Once you have this template, all you do is color in your obelisk in any way that you would prefer, and then you'll cut it out. So to cut it out, you'll need your handy dandy scissors. And then once you have it cut out, you can use either tape or glue to glue the pieces together. And voila, you'll have your very own paper steely. All right, my friends, thank you so much for joining me. Visit snow-isle.org forward slash summer dash reads for additional online resources and printable materials. I appreciate your time and I hope you guys learned something. Have a great day. Welcome back. I hope you had fun. Please send photos of your completed projects to summer shorts at snowisle.org and maybe they'll be featured on our website. Join us next week for more summer shorts Tuesday at two o'clock. In the meantime, you can read, learn, and discover by visiting our website, snowisle.org slash summer dash reading for a list of all our virtual programs. You can also find a printable reading log, read for 10 hours over the summer and get a free prize book. If you read an additional 10 hours, your name will go into a drawing for a grand prize. So keep digging and we will see you next week. From my family to yours, have a great summer. Do you see the resemblance? I hope not. Bye. Obelisks are a little bit more um, 